Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we're going to be talking about how to debrief to win with Robert Cujo Teshner. So, Cujo, how you doing today, my friend? I'm magnificent today. Great to be here in your midst. You're firing me up. Oh, man, I'm so excited to have you here today. Uh, let's just jump right in because I'll tell you what, debrief to win. And look, we're going to have that in the show notes for our listeners. I got my copy right here. So let's jump into what is your definition of a debrief? Yeah, the debrief, uh, very simply put, it's the constructive evaluation of the quality of our decisions and associated actions measured against the objectives we set out to achieve. God, sounds complex, sounds somewhat onerous, sounds for, foreboding or whatever else. It's actually a really, really beautiful thing. It's a fantastic instrument to help a team to be its best. Yeah, absolutely. And it's something we just don't think of enough, you know, particularly in business. And a lot of times we hear the word feedback come back, right? <laughs> if we, give me some feedback. I want to hear some feedback. So what's what's missing when we think about just feedback? You know, that's that's pretty narrow thinking, right? Yeah, it's it's not it's not just what's missing. It's what damage are we doing when we provide feedback? And we've got this mentality right now in business where we we supposedly thrive on feedback, which is delivered as constructive criticism. Hey, I've, I've identified a fault or a gap, a deficiency, an issue. I'm going to provide you with some, some, uh, some counsel about that to make you better, right? And that's the, that's the whole thing. It's been drummed into us. We've experienced it you know, through the decades now. And what we're finding, the more that we dig into how do human beings optimize performance, is that the constant drumming of you're doing this wrong and this wrong and this wrong actually works against us. Uh, and so feedback can actually be poisonous. Feedback without clarity of what is the standard against which we're measuring. Feedback without empathy for why it is that people did the things that they did in the context of doing it. Feedback delivered absent uh, a clarity of what the grading scale is that we're measuring against. And feedback delivered one way. Uh, I'm actually, the, the more that I spend time doing what I do, the less interested I am in that particular approach. In fact, the more I say it's 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 poison. Ah. Mm, really? Okay. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Just be, just because of that that tip, that mindset and that approach. Yeah. I mean, think about it. How many how many people respond well to Chris? You screwed up again today. Chris, you screwed up again today. Chris, you screwed up again today. Chris, I love you, but you screwed up again today. Hey, Chris, you you, you screwed up again. I mean. Most of us can tolerate a certain amount of that. At some point, if that's all that we ever get, we can probably start to detune it, in which case it's not very effective. But it's not the, it's not the place that, that we go to to really be our best. There are better ways to help people to learn. There right. are coaching methodologies that are designed to help somebody to grow. And feedback, as it's currently delivered in business, I think works against us. Right. Now, I'm so glad you, that you said that because you also mentioned in your book, and again, listeners, go to the show notes. We'll have links to, to Cujo's book, his materials, all his resources. But you talk about culture. I mean, a lot of times you got to have that right culture to have an effective debrief to really move in, in the right direction. And, you know, how, how criti critical is that? And what do you look for? Because you, you work with a lot of organizations. When you walk in, what, can, what, do you, what, what are you, you signs do you see to know, you know what, this is a pretty cool culture here versus – I got some work to do. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great question. When we look at what, it, what makes a team, and I use as a reference uh, a book called The Wisdom of Teams, written by two researchers who spent about 20 years studying teams, John Kotzenbach and Doug Smith. They say that a team is a small group of people with complementary skills that shares commitment to a common purpose, mm -hmm. to performance goals, to an approach they've crafted for which they hold themselves mutually accountable. And they say you need to have all six of those components to be one. What they miss in that definition is the behavioral components of how it is that we interact with one another. And those behavioral components of how it is that we interact are arguably more important than any of the other components of a team. So, so you know, we can we can have all of the above commitment to purpose, performance goals, give you credit for size and skills, and approach that we do. We've ritualized accountability. But if I'm a jerk to you, or you're a jerk to me, we're able to criticize without empathy. We're able to punish brutally. You know, all in the interests of achieving our performance goals. We're not a team. In fact, we're we're a, we're a toxic environment where people do not thrive. So, what do I look for? Is how do people interact with one another and what behaviors are right. important to us? What are the core values that we don't just have written on a wall, but actually are intentional about living? 
And, and how do we hold ourselves accountable for doing that? For me, what's much more important, what isn't in the book, actually, because when I wrote the book, I didn't have as many swings of the bat in businesses as I do now. The next edition of the book is going to highlight the necessity of debrief to win core values, which start with vulnerability. They also include empathy. So what I'm looking for is, are you, Chris, as the CEO of your company, able to and consistently demonstrate vulnerability, able to and then consistently demonstrate active vulnerability, admitting your mistakes and weaknesses in front of your subordinates and your peers. Right. That's a big deal. If you can't do that, then we, we can't really debrief to win because the debrief, the process of holding oneself accountable for the outcomes that the, that the team achieves, taking absolute ownership for the outcomes that the team achieves, that can only take place if we as leaders can be vulnerable. Right. The other thing is, you know, if, if, if we're, if we're able to be vulnerable ourselves, but then also attack without, without having empathy, understanding the context within which decisions are made, that doesn't work either. So I think, I think there's a, there's a cultural foundation centered on the active practice of debrief to win core values. And, and there's six of them, by the way, it's vulnerability, collaboration, Empathy, self-awareness, self-awareness as a component of emotional intelligence, uh, humility and ownership. Mm-hmm. And so if, if we if we can't if we can't practice those, then all the process in the world isn't really going to matter. Right. Right. And so, I mean, it's so interesting that you bring up vulnerability and empathy, because that's just not something that you think of when you think of leadership. You know, you just. That's two buzzwords that just aren't out there. Not many business books talk about you need to be a more vulnerable leader, right? You know, but uh, there's also another word you've mentioned, I think, four or five times already, accountability. And so let me just ask you straight up, is accountability a dirty word? I mean, (laughs) people consider that a dirty word in business, man. People, people. Okay, so it depends on who you ask. Okay. The CEO and the C-suite, they're going to say, we demand accountability. Oh, yeah, we want it. We got to have it. Right. Whether or not that applies to them is a separate question, right? But they, they definitely <laughs> demand accountability from, from down below. From down below's perspective, it's a, oh, no, oh, no. They're, they're going to hold us accountable. So it's a threat. It's a threat of punishment. So if something goes poorly around here, I'm going to be held accountable, and this isn't a good thing. Right. And so therefore, there's so much, there's so much baggage, negative emotion, um, apprehension, Tied to that word that, yeah, it is, it is a bad word in business. The problem is it, 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 it shouldn't be. Not only shouldn't it be, it, ha- it has to be the opposite of that. Right. The reason right. why the C-suite demands accountability is, is that they're demanding performance. And so they see holding somebody accountable as a means of generating performance. And that's a fear-based approach. Okay. So just think about this this way. Like, like how do we inspire and motivate our teammates to be their best? Fear can do it for a short period of time. If you study fear, you'll find that fear can get you performance, but you're going to have that performance and it's going to drop off pretty precipitously and very, very quickly. So then you ask yourself, well, then if fear isn't the way and if using accountability and a fear-based approach to drive performance isn't going to get us there, then then how else can we harness this thing? My answer is we hold ourselves collectively accountable uh, for the good and the bad. And just the, the piece of this where we're talking about accountability for the good, that's a part that I don't know that we're harnessing so well in business. I mean, there's businesses that do a brilliant job of it, but I don't know that, that most businesses do. I get a lot of right. feedback from business leaders who say, we don't have time to hold ourselves accountable for the wins. You know, it's only, we, we've only got time to dig into the losses and right. therein lies the root of the problem. So I say, let's hold Chris accountable for the good that he's done, which means let's go ahead and celebrate the fact that Based upon the facts, we can substantiate Chris is the origin story to why it was that we won the contract, finished the project under time, made an X many million dollar, you know, boost over whatever. Let's let's make sure to make a big deal about that. Right. Because because we're holding you accountable for the good that you've achieved. And that's that's a that's a great part of this. Then the other piece is when you're talking about, you know, dissecting a failure, um, holding ourselves accountable for a loss. The question is. Do we blame punish or do we enter into a, into a different mindset? Do we coach for resilience to help the team to rebound from this, to help us to harness this loss as one of the best opportunities we've ever had? Right. And if we can go with option B, where the accountability isn't 
holding ourselves accountable in a punishment way, but really using accountability as a means to coach the team to have a better tomorrow, then we're onto something. Yeah. Right. You know, I'm thinking back through my days at Eco, I've managed a lot of people over the years and in the mo- we used to have a motor repair business and quick story here. We had, we, we built our own in-house uh, program to manage the, the process. Okay. So all the repairs, it goes through very process driven. We're a bunch of engineers. So there you go. But we had a report and we ran a report and it was basically, it would work off of this, your standard hours. You had to complete the task. This is how long it took you to complete the task. And, you know, you either came in above or below. And then we would look at that for all the jobs and I would run it and the report was actually color coded. So when we really sucked, I mean, really sucked on a job, it would bleed red and this, it would pop up on the report. But inversely, we ran a report for when we crushed it and we made that, I think, blue or something like that. We color coded that. So when they come out and we, we expected, a, let's say, a margin of 20 percent and they rocked it and got somehow 50, you know, they, they really did good on their on their time. That hit the report. And we would sit down as a management team and naturally everybody would shut down when we, when we started looking at the bad stuff. But when we actually looked at the good ones, man, we found out we learned so much about our team, about how we quoted about what worked well, how we can replicate that on future jobs. And to the point where I almost completely just scrapped the bad ones because I just say, all right, guys, y'all know why you sucked on those jobs, right? Everybody's like, yep. All right. Now, how can we do the blue more, right? So, I mean, it's just, I think that type of mentality for, was huge for us, but it wasn't natural. We had to get there to start thinking to look at the wins. And I'll tell you what, first of all, I love your approach. Clearly, clearly that approach was working for you. You can see why people enjoy digging into their successes. Highlighting folks for the good that they're doing happens to be one of those things that causes people to want to come back and keep on keep on doing more good. So so that absolutely makes sense. But if you think about the losses as well, and to say, mm-hmm. hey, you guys know, you know why it was, and we can move on. Great technique, by the way. But if you were to take and and adopt a slightly different version of that, which is the one that says, let's smile as we dissect our our failures over here. Let's let's actually come into this thing just purely from an intellectual standpoint with smiles on our face and going, what do you think? So what 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 do we what do we what do we gather from this whole thing? Just from an intellectually Mm -hmm. curious standpoint, Mm -hmm. you know, and if you can do that, because usually we're like, oh, no, we're good. If we can smile as we're dissecting, intellectually curious to learn, to help us to, to ensure that we never lose this way again, right. I think it can also serve as well. The point of the matter is we've been conditioned to criticize. Over time, it has been drummed into us to find fault. Mm-hmm. You give somebody the opportunity to provide feedback on something, I guarantee you they're going to be critical. Right. You know, and, and then you ask people... How how did that feel? And they're like, well, you know, you're probably right. I probably I probably did do this wrong. I probably did do this wrong. But like you're you're basically you're basically attacking their soul, right? And deep down the inside, in a place that none of us wants to admit exists, we're going ah, this, mm, yeah. And um, and I don't know that's the best way. Leadership is situational. There are times to be hard. There are times. There are times when the best way to address something is to say you will never ever right do that again have i made myself clear because like dude i got you i got you brother like okay cool and then we're done and we're right, right back to whatever but but by and large the, 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 the mindset of constant criticism yeah it doesn't serve us no, not, not especially not at a time when there are opportunities for people to go elsewhere and they're actively doing so Right. That's right. Yeah. I mean, because employee retention is so big, right? These days. I mean, just and when, you, when you get a good winning team, the last thing you'll know is break it up because of your, your methodology of, of feedback is just, is just crippling it. So, uh, I love it. So let's, let's dig into your methodology, how you do this with, uh, with your deep debrief focused approach. You kind of, you touched on that earlier, but paint that picture for the listeners a little bit better on, on how, what you teach and, and, and how you find value in, in your process here. Absolutely. Well, you know, so, so, you know, backing things up a little bit, um, as a guy that grew up uh, as a young fighter pilot trying to understand how to do a really complex miss, miss, mission set uh, in a dangerous world, um, I learned through the active practice of being coached every single mission how to learn from my mistakes in a positive way. So I lived what we're talking about. That's the first thing to point out. I lived what we talked about. And in the process of living what I talked about, we're very intentional in a, in a fighter squad. We're very intentional about making sure that we're clear on what we're trying to accomplish. 
So we had absolute clarity of, hey, what is the mission today? What are the objectives? What are, we, what, what are the standards against which we're going to hold ourselves? And then, you know, what's the plan to achieve it? So we, mm-hmm. we, we set ourselves up to achieve success. Like there was no confusion in anybody's mind. There wasn't a, hey, what does the boss want today kind of a deal? And, right. you know, is it possible for us to get it? It was absolute clarity. This is the mission. Here's how we're going to grade ourselves. And here's the plan that we've achieved or set up to achieve success. And then we went out there and, and tried our best to do it. And if I can pause for just one second, uh, I would tell you that what I've noticed in, in business is a lot of times we lack clarity. Yeah. Yeah. And so you got a team that's you know, working out there and like, and I don't even, I don't even know what, what the boss really wants from me here. I just know we've got a deadline. It's got to be done by this afternoon. So I'm going to, I'm going to shoot from the hip here and hope that it's close enough. And, you know, and that right. doesn't inspire people. Right. Nope. So we had absolute clarity. And we were very intentional. We had we had ways to plan and we had ways to communicate the plan so that everybody stepping out the door to go fly a mission knew exactly what we were trying to achieve and had confidence, by the way, that, that success was achievable. And then you go out there and fly. And here's the thing that was interesting about the fighter pilot business. You had brilliant days where you were just on fire. Like, and you had global situational awareness. You knew what was going on around you. You were processing, making intelligent decisions, you were on point. And there were days where you, you were just falling back to, let me just aviate, navigate, and communicate. Let me just do the fundamentals to not crash or hit a mountain or do something else horrible. And you couldn't necessarily choose what day you were going to have uh, stepping out the door. Some days were great. Some days weren't. And that's an interesting dynamic. There were some days when you couldn't do anything wrong. There were some days when you couldn't do anything right. And then you'd come back in and, and you'd learn from it. But the funny thing is, is that all of us knew that that was the case. We understood and empathized the fact that some days you were on and some days you weren't. And in the, in, in the debrief that we would conduct after every mission, our accountability practice that follows every mission, not just some of the missions, not just the missions that we have the time to debrief, every single one of the missions that we ever flew, we came in there not to attack, punish, crucify, blame, or rather to learn. So the intent was to learn, and the intent was to learn so that the next time we did this, the next time we flew a mission, would be better than this one. And so if you could visualize a circle, a circle that starts with planning, with a communication of the plan, with an execution phase where we're out there doing what it is that we said that we were going to do, and then a debrief or accountability phase where where we're really learning, we're learning in a way that's we're coaching up our teammates so that the next time is going to be better. If we won today, we're going to win bigger tomorrow. If we lost today, we're going to bounce back and win tomorrow. That was the approach that we use day in and day out to be as tight as we could be, to be ready to answer the nation's call to go forth and to defend our, our country as directed. And I found it to be something that I took somewhat for granted when I was on active duty, but looking back on a brilliant approach to building teams that don't just win, but build the bonds of trust. Right. So I, I think back to who it is on the planet who I trust implicitly. It is right. everybody that I flew with in the United States Air Force because what I found was in the debrief, everybody was so, so eager to learn from their mistakes today. And we never flew ever in my, in my career, a perfect mission, eager to learn from the mistakes to become that much more excellent next time. And that's a right. pretty cool thing. It demands that we're vulnerable, that we're able to admit our weaknesses and mistakes in front of each other. How do you build the bonds of trust? By being truthful and honest, demonstrating integrity. Vulnerability is a demonstration of integrity in that context. Yeah. That's, yeah. A, that's a pretty important thing. The ability to self-regulate. I mean, you're, you're angry, you're a type A player, you want to win, you want to come in and just be like, oh, dude. but to be able to turn that thing around and go, all right, what does the team need from me right now? Do they need my anger? Do they need me to just lose my mind? Probably not. To be able to turn anger into a, all right, team, maybe we're a little bit disappointed about today. You know what? This could have been the biggest gift we've ever had, the opportunity to learn from a spectacular disaster so that we never have that experience again. That's something that builds the bonds of trust. Having yeah, a, yeah. Have a team lead who can sit there and say, Chris, let me ask you, how many, times, how many times have you done this particular repair? How many times have you installed this particular piece of software? How many times have you 
typed in this code or engineered this thing, whatever it is that we do around here. And your answer is, well, this is my second time ever, boss. Like, hey, man, that's important to know. This is the second time we've ever done. Who here thinks that Chris needs to be perfect at what it is that he's doing the second time that he does it? Anybody, anybody feel that way? Raise your hand. No, nobody raises their hand. Okay, cool. Chris, let me tell you what. Not only is this the second time that you've done this, and, and while I can see that you're a little bit disappointed that maybe it, it wasn't as strong as it could be, you did this right, you did this right, you did this right, you did this right, you did this right. You did five out of the six things right here, brother. And on the second time ever doing this, that's impressive. In fact, guys, what do you think? I'm, remember when I did this the second time? I got like one thing right. Remember that? Yeah. Yeah. Look at how good Chris is doing. Now, when Chris gets that kind of feedback, he's done five out of six things right the second time that he's ever done this demonstrated empathy from his, from his leader. He can't help but be inspired. He's like, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm on track around here. The, the, yeah. the, the team sees that I'm actually doing okay. All right, good. I'm going to get it all right tomorrow. Right. You know, that's a, that's a powerful approach to learning. Right. And I mean, if you're talking, you're digging right there into something that many people never think about. Like you, you cared about my perspective and how I see the world versus, you know, your perspective. Cause I, they're not the same. You know, you've been doing this a lot longer than me in this example, right? So, I mean, is that is that a misstep that you see happen a lot in business as we don't take that time to understand the perspective? Oh, absolutely. We assume, I think, because it's drummed into us as well, that as leaders, we have exclusive rights to the facts. And so we'll come into a situation, we'll say, oh, yeah, here's a problem, fix it. Here's a problem, fix it. Here's a problem, fix it. And what the team is doing, because they're subordinate to the leader, they're like, yeah, yes, sir. Got it. We'll, we'll fix it. But on the right. inside or and, you know, if, at the water cooler, they're like, this dude has no clue what's going on around here. He has no clue. We don't have right. the resources. We don't have the time. It was 700 billion degrees. We almost lost somebody. Like, we're lucky to be alive. I mean, whatever. <laughs> he yeah. thinks he knows everything. So we have the finger pointing coming from the team. We've got the leader who's like, I've just solved their problem. And these two things do not create what it is that either side needs. Team co cohesion is centered around leaders potentially recognizing they have no clue actually what the real facts are. And if we go into a situation saying, I think I know everything, which means I probably don't know anything, then we're onto something. And so now what it forces us to do is to gather some perspectives. Hey, Pete, what actually took place? Susan, what, what did you see go down, Michelle? And now as we start to gather individual perspectives, we as leaders start to open our, our minds to the reality of what took place here. And then we suddenly go, wait a second, I've totally missed the mark. I had no clue that this was how bad it was for them. Actually, the, the real reason that they're not succeeding is I haven't equipped them to win. And that's on me. Right. Which then, of course, demands some vulnerability uh, to make that acknowledgement. But I promise you, a leader that can gather the truth from, from his or her team and realize where it is that as a leader, they're letting the team down and can say to the team, here's what I've been failing you at. And here's what I'm going to correct because I own this outcome. That's a leader that suddenly builds trust with the right. team. Right. Right. It, it takes some effort. Like it's hard. It's hard for us to come out of the defensive crouch as a leader to say, hey, everybody demands that I know everything. I've got to be the heroic leader who, you know, solves all problems. To come out of that into the, hey, this one was on me. I'll own the fact that I screwed this thing up. That's, it, it's a perception thing. We, we think that that's, that's a risk. It's right. actually the most freeing moment that we can experience as leaders. And as soon as we've embraced that, we've unlocked the potential of our team. Right. True potential of our teams. Well, that, I mean, but I saw spe also speaks to an extreme amount of humility that as a leader, you have to, to, to demonstrate every day. Not to mention just the extreme level of ownership that you need to demonstrate every day in the situation to be able to bring that out of your team. And your your book, I love you because you you have so many great examples from the military. Just curious, as you as you've been working with more companies in the civilian world, is is that a, is that a hard transition for for civilians to get into that type of thinking with civilian companies for for the debrief to win strategy? Yeah, I don't think so. And I think the beauty of the beauty of of, uh, of going in there and teaching is when you ex when you explain to somebody how effective these approaches are, and you can you can demonstrate based upon a lifetime of having lived it, and you can push back against what people right. think is the. I mean, you saw Top Gun one, right? It comes out in 1986. Did we see any humility from anybody in that film yeah. whatsoever? 
Probably not. Okay. And if humility is defined right. as freedom from pride and, and ego, we saw 0% humility there. So people have, have been conditioned to believe that the, the least humble folks on the planet are going to be your fighter pilots. So to come in and say, we win because we're humble. And here's, here's an, a demonstration of that. Uh, that's eye opening. And, and suddenly people realize maybe they, maybe they had a misperception of how some of our elite teams actually organized to win. And because they recognize the misperception or hearing from somebody that comes from that world, this is the, the ticket to our success. They're willing to give it a shot. It is stunning yeah. how quickly people can embrace the core values when they, when they realize how effective they are. And by the way, as an aside, I'm wearing this patch. This is the patch that the Air Force awards to graduates of our weapons instructor course, formerly known as the Fighter Weapons Instructor Course of the Fighter Weapons School. It is the Air Force Top Gun Program. In order to earn the right to wear this patch, you've got to be three things. You've got a credo at the Weapons Instructor Course. You've got to be, first of all, humble. You have to be humble. You have to be free from pride and ego to be able to learn from your mistakes. And none of us have ever, in the history of the Weapons School, flown a perfect mission. So there's always opportunities uh, to learn, necessitating right. humility. That's the first of the three right. in the credo. Yeah. And then here's the thing. If, you, if you're watching people that you look up to, and, and for me as a young fighter pilot, I looked up to our instructor pilots. Those are the folks that had, that had elevated to the level where they were teachers. Um, they were responsible for helping to shape me and, and my teammates to become our very best. When you saw them demonstrating humility how could you not personally do the same when the people that you looked yeah. up to were being vulnerable not some of the times not when it was convenient to do so for the messaging or whatever but but all of the times how could you not right. yourself be vulnerable the demonstrated the modeling behavior of our leaders was so powerful and i saw it and that conditioned me and this is light years before i understood what the concepts were that i'm now teaching it just was the right. it was just the environment that was Took it for granted yes, when sir. I lived it. It was just there. Then when I'm writing the book, that's where I'm uncovering things that I had never heard of before, but it actually benefited from. I never heard of the term psychological safety, by the way. I mentioned it in the right. book. I have a big thing about psych the, the imperative of psychological safety. What is it? Dr. Timothy Clark defines it as an environment of rewarded vulnerability. Guess who lived it? This guy. But I had no clue. We never said, hey, make sure that you're psychologically safe today. <laughs> right, 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 right. It was just it was just the way that we did things, that we were unique. We're a unique tribe, sub-tribe within the Air Force. But this is, the, the, this is what allows us to be successful. And so businesses, once they recognize the value, the imperative of this, it's easy right. for them to adopt. Okay. Now, you mm -hmm. have my curiosity through the roof right now, Cujo. So humility is number one. You said there's three. What's the other two? Can you tell yeah, me? Appro or <laughs> approachable and credible. So okay. approachability is, is a necessary precondition to learning. Like if you're a teacher, but you're not approachable, nobody, nobody's going to want to learn from you. Okay. Weapon school graduates, they're teachers first. They have to be approachable. They've got to be humble to be able to learn from their mistakes and failures. They've got to be approachable because they're teachers always. And what they teach has got to be credible, humble, approachable, credible. It's got to be credible because lives are on the line. You can't just come up with a theory and go, you know what? I'm just going to tout this because I feel like it today. What you teach has got to be grounded in fact and truth. And, okay. and so that's a, like a, a, a perfect little bundle there for what it is that you'd want from any of your leaders in any organization. Man, I love the temple. Well, thank you for, for unpacking that. Now, I'm also curious. Again, you've helped so many organizations out there. You have any success stories that jump out that you personally witnessed from businesses that embrace, you know, your process here? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I've got to be careful what I say so as to protect the innocent. Uh, working uh, with an executive leadership team of incredibly talented individuals who um, are the best at what they do, the company blowing their competition out of the water, growing like gangbusters. The only issue is, as an executive leadership team, toxic environment. Nobody wants to come to their meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody's poised. Everybody's poised to attack one another. They're waiting for the initial salvo so that they can launch a violent counterattack. Right. And who thrives in that kind of environment? So it's, it's a case where you can you can see the we can achieve 
material wealth and success, we can grow a company even though the core is not healthy. I wouldn't say rotten, but I would say not healthy. And it took, it took, I guess, simple exposure to the reality of, hey, this isn't, this isn't our, our best. And by the way, if, if we want to harness all of our skill sets, we've got to really learn how to team effectively because as good as we are, we're leaving performance on the table. Our behaviors are the key to unlocking who it is that we actually can be. Let's hold ourselves accountable for living these core values. It was a game-changing moment for, for especially a couple of members of that team who really needed to understand what right looked like. Nobody had ever showed it to them before. And that was, right. that was a moving experience for me. Uh, to be just a small part of, right? Um, and then just a very practical experience of working with a with a group of people in another industry who probably weren't too excited to spend, and we spent one day, eight hours digging into the core components of how to debrief to win, cultural and process. At the end of that time, revelations from several of the people that, yeah, this idea of being vulnerable is probably the piece that's missing from my leadership skill set, something that I need to, to bring on board. And that, that company takes off, height of the pandemic, in the midst of so many disruptions, turns their ship around and becomes so much more successful based upon the application of process, but also a little, a little dose of, you know, I think it comes back down to being vulnerable. Um, being able to say, hey, we're screwing this thing up and, and the other thing, and it's on me, and you know, yeah. I'm gonna take ownership of that. We're gonna we're gonna learn from this and have a better day. I mean, again, trying to protect the innocent so as to not, you know, give away any details, but but I'm seeing it consistently. This is this is rewarding work. Yeah. And it's rewarding and, and it's rewarding like I hoped it would be, because see, here's the thing, Chris. I had the benefit of living it. Right. I had the benefit of living it so I know that it can be done. A lot of times people will ask me, is it possible, Cujo, in today's world to get to absolute ownership? Surely that's an impossible standard. I'm like, yeah, it is possible. You just have, you have to believe in it and you have to also see what right looks like. Right. And once you've seen what right looks like and you believe that you can achieve it, then, man, it's, it's an awesome transition. Yeah, yeah. Well, man, thank you for sharing what you could there. And I tell you what, Cujo, the reason you're on here, because I got to personally see you. You speak at a Vistage group, and it's the most fired up I've ever been at a Vistage meeting. And and so I can tell you one thing: I can only imagine you in front of a, all these businesses. The the you know, the energy that you bring, but not just energy, just the information, the insight, the wisdom, everything that you share. So, and this has been awesome. So let let's transition a little bit because I mean our listeners are listening here. They're, they're hearing me call you Cujo. We haven't really told your story yet. So, man, give us a little bit of your story for our listeners who are probably on the edge of the seat. Like, who is this Cujo guy? <laughs> Clearly, he had some mean parents. Yeah, this Cujo guy uh, is a <laughs> former classically trained, classically trained uh, violin and piano player. I uh, grew up with the Suzuki method of violin instruction. So when I was two years old, I was learning by ear. I still can't read music, but I can I can play music pretty well. Um, who evolved into lived in Germany? It was I went to German public schools. I used to dream and think in German, speak fluent German. Came back, went to three different high schools. Dad was in the Air Force, and so we moved all over the place. Um, but had this passion since four years old, since I saw Star Wars, uh, to be a fighter pilot. Definitely wanted to be a fighter pilot. Knew okay. it was in my core to be a fighter pilot. Got, got an opportunity as the tail end Charlie of my class uh, to go to the Air Force Academy. I was denied acceptance, but got in at the last possible minute. Uh, made it through a really grueling four-year undergraduate program and got a pilot slot at a time when the Air Force was cutting back on pilot slots. So I was very, very fortunate. Almost washed out of F-15 school. Um, I started out the program brilliantly Monday. Uh, by Wednesday, I was on an elimination ride, got through by the skin of my teeth and uh, and shows up in my first operational fighter squadron after two years of pilot training and introduction to fighter fundamental training and F-15 school, finally in a, in a place to live my dream. And uh, day one at the new fighter squadron, I was given a temporary call sign uh, of FNG-3, say friggin' new guy three, because uh, there were two new guys ahead of me. <laughs> and that's how I was known. That's how I was known for the first six months of my uh, of my flying career. 
And eventually, uh, one afternoon, somebody taps me on the shoulder and says, hey, make sure that you're at roll call on, on Friday. And I knew that something special was about to happen. And sure enough, it was my naming ceremony. And the naming ceremony is something that's it's kind of new uh, in the Air Force fighter circles. It comes in post-Vietnam, prior to Desert Storm. And so uh, if you have any Vietnam-era friends, relatives, they went with nicknames, but not call signs. Uh, and then across the Air Force, naming ceremonies are semi-formal, informal, you can pick your own, or they can be really, really serious. The F-15, F-22 community, very, very serious. And you go to the naming ceremony, and um, the whole tribe is there. Everybody's there, and they start telling stories about you. And the threshold of truth for the stories that are told is the stories have to be at least 10% true. <laughs> and uh, it's a festive atmosphere. And if you, as the namey, can keep your mouth shut, not influence, not respond. When somebody says, hey, is that how it went? You know, if you can just sit there and, and be like, to the 58th fighter squadron with a smile on your face, you're going to turn out okay. Right. And that evening, the tribe got together, told a bunch of stories. Uh, they, based upon the stories that were told, came up with potential call signs. They whittled it down to two. They asked me which one I preferred. And they picked, because uh, I didn't have an input, they, they, picked, uh, they picked Cujo. I'm not allowed to tell any of the stories that were told of my naming, um, but I can tell you that the call sign that they awarded me is something very, very special to me and something that I'll take for the rest of my life and, and ask people professionally to refer to me as. I prefer to be known as Cujo professionally. Right. A bit off-putting in some circles, but most of the time people embrace it. Uh, it is kind of a unique moniker, but that's how we know each other in the fighter business. Um, you could tell me, Hey, uh, I ran across a guy named Brad Ertmer the other day. Uh, you ever fly with him? Like, eh, I don't know if I've ever heard of him. one of my best friends of all time. But if you, if you were to say, Hey, I saw a mute at the airport the other day, I'm like, how is that son of a gun? You know I mean? We know right. each other by our call signs, not by our first names. And so, so it's a pretty cool tradition. And it's one of the many things that we've done to build the bonds of cohesion, um, camaraderie and trust in a fighter squadron. And I think, I think done well, it works very effectively. Right. Now, so keep, keep going. Cause right now you're, you're the max group. So get, get us to, how did you get to where you're at right now? Yeah. So I have the opportunity, the privilege to attend the uh, air force weapons instructor course, fighter weapons school, the air force top gun program. Um, I graduated uh, and, and got invited back as an instructor. So I got a chance to teach there. Uh, that was all in the F-15 uh, Eagle, the single seat air superiority version of the F-15. Uh, did some staff assignments, got some degrees, came back and transitioned into the F-22 program, got a chance to fly the Raptor. Uh, so a fifth generation invisible to enemy radar aircraft, brilliant machine. I mean, it's just a, a it is a supreme airplane. Uh, such an honor to be able to fly that. And my career is going... Uh, Going pretty well. Um, very satisfied with how things are going. Have some. I get married along the way to the beautiful Miss Diane. We start having children. Uh, at the point where she's pregnant with child number four, I'll get diagnosed with colorectal cancer. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, in that moment, we find out who we really are. It turns out that all of these years of living the fighter pilot lifestyle served us incredibly well. My wife and I, the first thing that we did after the diagnosis of, hey, we found a tumor in your lower colon. I think it's been growing for a decade. Um, it's going to take us five days to get the biopsy results. We don't know in that moment if it's days, weeks, or months uh, left to live. And again, six months pregnant with our fourth child, dicey time for, uh, for Diane, for sure, and for the baby. First thing we did in that moment was we went to have lunch. I was starving from the colonoscopy prep. Diane was always starving as, a, as an expectant mother. And at lunch, in a little cafe in downtown Stuttgart, Germany, we looked at each other and affirmed that our story just got better. And it's funny looking back on that. That was an instinctive move. Mm -hmm. Like there was, there was no, it was not like, the, let's try to like create something that if we live through this, we could, you know, write down and make a big deal about make you know, <laughs> a lifetime movie or something. Um, it was instinctive to say, Hey, we just took a huge hit. We're still going to win. Why? 
Because it's a mindset that we have in a fighter squad. Nothing ever goes according to plan. Mm -hmm. and, and as I mentioned, we're very intentional about building plans, but but we do that, and part of the planning process is to think through all the things that could go wrong. We anticipate things going wrong. We don't anticipate mm -hmm. things going right. We anticipate things going right. And we love being able to tell the story of how despite this problem, that problem, the other thing, we still came out victorious. If you had to pick between two stories, the one where everything went according to plan and the one where everything didn't, you still won. <laughs> That's the one that people want to hear. Right. And so what was funny, and I, I could kind of see this from, from the vantage point of somebody looking down on us, I had this kind of third person uh, view of we're living the fighter pilot experience still in this moment and it's serving us so well. We needed that boost in that moment. And we set a mindset, my wife and I did, that we're going to do everything in our power. And there's so much that's out of our control here. But whatever it is that we can control, we're going to harness to make sure that we make it the best story possible. Mm -hmm. And in that moment, my wife and I, we, we got closer mm -hmm. than we'd ever been before. And in that moment, uh, we started to laugh. I think the two of us laughed more during the worst phase of my physical life than at any point previous. We laughed about almost everything. I mean, we laughed about the pain. We laughed about some of the loss of <laughs> pride from the tests that had to be done. I mean, just you name it, we laughed. And it was in that laughter that we found hope and we found togetherness. And it was awesome. Uh, it's also because of because of the cancer that I'll have to shut down my Air Force. I, I shouldn't say have to. Uh, chose to reduce stress in life by leaving the Air Force and falling back to St. Louis and and starting a new life. Uh, and and so that was a that was actually there was so much good that came from that journey, and I'm very very grateful for it, and always will be. And then that leads to the pivot into entrepreneurship, part of a couple of companies that don't quite pan out. Uh, and what I find is a constant thread about the two companies that don't pan out. Uh, they're not really practicing the teamwork principles that we had in the fighter squadron and the accountability piece is lacking. And so there's always been a suspicion in my mind that what it was that we did in a fighter squadron could be translated into business. Mm -hmm. And we use this as the opportunity to take action on it, to test it out, to test the theory that a, a business team can become a high performance team, right. that we can cross apply our performance team principles into the domain where we desperately need it because small businesses are the backbone of our economy. Mm -hmm. And that led to the creation of BMAX Group. And here we are today. Man, what a powerful story, Kujo. I mean, thank you so much for, for sharing it, for, for being so vulnerable. I, I, I've heard your story. I was hoping you, you would share the details you did. So, man, just what an incredible, incredible journey that you've been on. I cannot wait to see where, where it takes you next. And uh, just, just a testament to you and your leadership. And, uh, you know, that's that's a... I'm at a loss for words, really, my friends. So just, just thank you again. And as someone that is transitioning, you know, we, we, we do serve a lot of military here on Eco Ask Why, and would love to, to get advice from people like yourself who have who've made that transition from the military to the civilian workforce. Any advice out there uh, that you would, that you would offer up for someone who is making that transition on, on what maybe worked uh, work for you or helped you? Absolutely. But before I get to that, if I could, yes. thank you. Thank you very much for the kind words. I'm going to, in turn, uh, send my thanks back to the people who trained me. Okay. And I, it's a daily prayer of thanksgiving for me that the folks that were appointed as leaders over me throughout the course of my professional development in the, in the military cared so much about making me my best. Mm -hmm. And they poured so much into me in order to make me my best uh, that I'm, I'm eternally blessed. And I look at my teammates who did the exact same thing. I mean, we're talking about nameless kids who will never get any recognition anywhere, who as a instructor pilot in the F-15 were there at two o'clock in the morning teaching Cujo, young Cujo, how to have the right mindset to bounce back from a particularly horrible day at a time when you're not, you're not doing it because you're getting paid extra, you're not doing it because you're gonna be celebrated for it. It's just the right thing to do. I benefited from that. I benefited from that professionally, but then also personally. The mindset that my wife and I got, it wasn't ours. Right. It wasn't something that I was born with. It was something that I was trained to as a fighter pilot. It just happened to serve us so well. So I thank in turn those who, who gave me that gift. And then to those who are making the, the transition out, here's something that I'm, I'm very, very passionate about. And it is this. Don't pigeonhole yourself. 
Don't assume that you can only do X, Y, or Z because you've never done A, B, or C before. You have. You've done everything that's needed of you in a civilian business. We just we just have to translate the names and the nomenclature, the verbiage, maybe soften some of your approaches just a touch. Right. But what you do have, without a doubt, and I don't care if you're somebody that served in the Marine Corps for only four years and are now walking out of that thing into, into life. You know how to team, you know how to lead, you know discipline, you know the centrality of a mission. You've got so much that has been instilled in you since day one of boot camp. And if you can take and harness just a little bit of that to the extreme benefit of your teammates in whatever else it is that you do in life, oh, you're going to be a treasure. So don't pigeonhole yourself. Don't just assume, well, I was trained on X, Y, or Z, or I'm just A. Don't don't right. sell yourself short. You are a leader. You are a team leader. You're an outstanding teammate that's got so much goodness to you. Sky's the limit. You pick what it is that you want to go dominate and then do so. Amen, brother. I mean, and, and I'll speak to that. I mean, I had so many people that work with me. I've been on teams at Eco, and by far, the, the military backgrounds, those men and women, man. They, they have just been the the most delight to work with. They're the most fun to work with, too, by the way. I always have fun, particularly I work with a lot of Navy. So I went to Old Dominion right there at the, at the Navy base. I, I've worked with a lot of Navy uh, guys and girls over the years. So, uh, you know, good guys to have in your background, in your back pocket for sure. And then obviously the Air Force have my my, uh, my in-laws both serve in the Air Force. So uh, much, much love and respect for for all branches of military. So thank you, Kujo, for that. And uh, I'm curious. Let's have let's have one more fun question here. So you're a fighter pilot, ex fighter pilot. I, I, what's what's something about a fighter pilot that nobody would think of, that nobody would know? In, any any inside information? Because when, when you think about a fighter pilot nowadays, everybody thinks of, of Maverick and Top Gun, right? So is there something else that 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 you wouldn't think of about a fighter pilot that you like to share? Yeah, there's, there's actually any number of. <laughs> be careful with what I say. Here's here's what I'm saying because, because you did mention Maverick. I have to I have to dispel this. You know, so so people ask me constantly, what do you think about the new Top Gun movie? Right. Uh, I've seen it four times. And I love the new Top Gun movie. I, I don't I don't love all aspects of it. Is it is it technically correct all over the place? Heck no. But I don't care. It's irrelevant. The stuff that's inaccurate is irrelevant. I love the new Top Gun movie. Part of the thing that I love about it is that Maverick, you see his his evolution yeah. into into who he wasn't before, into into something that parallels what I feel like I, I experienced. Um, he's pensive. He's he's somewhat vulnerable. He takes ownership. He's he, he actually does become a teacher. He gives his all for the good of the team. I mean, there's a lot of goodness there. But but the part that's that's so wrong is when you see the the young Top Gun graduates and they're all assembling together playing pool. Yeah, they're a bunch of cocky folks who are trying to demonstrate who's the best amongst us, and they're yeah. they're knocking each other constantly. And what I would say is is that they got that part wrong. Mm. Yeah, there is a you want to be the you want to be the Top Gun of your squadron. There's no doubt about it. But the way that you get there is by being the best teacher in your squadron. You can't be a good teacher if you're just an arrogant whatever. I think what people don't, yeah. don't realize is how how good a teammates we are. And and I would, I would capstone that with this. Um, I was part of many squadrons in my Air Force career, but uh, recently the 27th Fighter Squadron, America's oldest fighter squadron based at Langley Air Force Base in Virginia. The year group that I was there for, you know, plus or minus a year or two, had a reunion. We went to Las Vegas. Uh, we did that because there was entertainment options and whatnot. Found that most of us didn't take advantage of any of them. We we got together. Why? Because we missed each other. It was an inconvenient weekend. Everybody was busy as all heck. But we just missed each other. We missed yeah. being together. And it, for me, it was about 19 years since the last time I'd been with that group of people. That was far too long. We teamed so well. It was like yeah. we were just together yesterday. The stories immediately took off again. It was such a brilliant thing. And my wife misses those people. I, mean, I was gone constantly, always at the squadron, always teaching, always. She misses being with them. And it's because we become a family. We are so tight that we are a family uh, and families need to get together again. So maybe maybe that's my my insight for yeah. it. The movie gets wrong. We're, we're dear, dear, dear friends because of the experiences that we share and the amount of time we spend together. Right. I love it. Thank you so much for sharing that. And 
Uh, last question about VMAX, and then we'll, we'll have a little fun here at the end. But at the work that you're doing now, Cujo, when do you get the most fulfillment? You know, wh- where do you find that joy at? I get the joy when somebody reports back, Cujo, you have no idea how big of an impact you've made on my team. And they might offer some details about the good that's happened, but when they come back and say, you're doing epic work, don't ever stop doing this, that gets me fired up. I hate missing my family. I hate being on the road as much as I am. I detest airports and airlines and hotels and rental cars and all the rest of this stuff. And I'll do all of that to continue to make our purpose come to life, to do good for teams and to help them to be their very best. It's worth doing. That is amazing. Well, let's have a little fun here at the end of, of our of our conversation, Cujo. Let's let's talk about you outside of uh, Air Force, outside of VMAX. Just what do you enjoy doing for fun? You got any hobbies you like to share? Yeah, it, it, my perfect day would involve it always being Friday, Friday evening, having the band together, literally in the basement. I'll be on bass guitar. We've got a good drummer. We've got a good lead vocal. We've got a good lead guitarist. We're playing. 70s and 80s rock music uh, with a little with a little concentration on uh, on U2. Oh, that would be perfect. And then to be able to take and and, to, and to put, on, put on a performance in the backyard for a bunch of friends. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, I love yeah. playing music today, and I love I love playing music with other people. I love being in a band, even if even if the music isn't perfect. Uh, bringing joy to people, watching them dance and sing along. That's that's powerful stuff. All right, all right. Now, just so you know, our executive producer here on the show, Adam, he's a, he's a big time drummer and guitar player as well. So if you need somebody, sure. you know, I think you can we can we can fly him right up there wherever you need, man. He could be a stand in for you. I'll come yeah. in and uh, you know I'll fill your, I'll fill your cups up in between songs. How about that? You know, but uh, <laughs> hey, hey, more. Okay, good percussion <laughs> session is set. Nice, I love it. That's it. That's it. That's it. Well, we also, you mentioned, we, we love hearing about family on Eco Ask Why. You mentioned, was it four children that you have? So now we've got five. Nicholas uh, comes to us post Air Force. He was born here in St. Louis. Okay. Okay. Five mm-hmm. children. Wow. That's amazing. And what's, what's the age range here? Yeah. So, um, so our oldest just turned 17. We've got 14, 11, 8, and 5. So we've we've had youngsters in the family for quite a t- quite a while, and as I'm reminded by the older kids, um, you know, I'll be in a wheelchair when Nicholas is out there playing baseball <laughs> somewhere down the road. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say, I will say this: as we're going through all the uh, the craziness of the sort of cattywampus last couple of years, uh, having this brood has been magnificent, and uh, my wife and I constantly comment on what a joy it's been to have just a, a group of people that we can fall back to and be together with as the world loses its yeah. mind, you know, we're still here together. And I'll also emphasize this, maybe someday one of, one of my children stumbles across this podcast. I want them to know how much they touched me. And in the moment we only had three, when I was going through the recovery from two horrific GI surgeries, they showed me unconditional love. Even as young children, they went out of their way to not, make too much noise, to not be angry at one another if they were close to dad. When they saw that dad was wincing or in pain, they tried to help out. I'll never forget that. I mean, what a, what a great thing. And um, yeah, so, so, so blessed to have this particular family and to be on this life journey with them. They're the best team that I've ever been on by far. Amen. Hey, man. It sounds, it sounds like an amazing team, man. And, and I'm with you there. I, so I have four. Uh, my youngest is 11 days old at the time of this recording. So, man, I have a really new new one here at the house. So first son, by the way. So uh, I'm trying not to. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm breaking into some new dirt here. So we'll we'll see. But I'm with you, man. I was I was actually today. Today we we went for uh, the family pictures this morning before we recorded this afternoon and uh, just looked in the rearview mirror of the car for the first. That was the first time we were all in the car together, all all, all six of us. And it was, my wife was like, car's pretty full, isn't it? And I'm like, yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yes. so it's, uh, it's pretty yes, awesome. It is. Congratulations. That's brilliant, brilliant news. Yes, sir. Well, thank you, sir. Well, let's, let's, at the very end of Eco Ask Why, we like to have a quick lightning round. This is a lot of fun for our listeners just to give a little bit of insight to, to some fun, some fun things for you. I'll, I'll vouch you rather. 
So if you're willing to play, we'll play that. And then we'll, we'll wrap up with our last question. You good? Let's do it. All right. So what is your favorite food, Cujo? Uh, I'll say a German bratwurst on Blutchen on a specifically Saturday morning where it's chilly outside. Okay. All right. Now, when, when you're when you're when you're jamming on the the uh, bass guitar there, do you have an adult beverage by your side? Uh, I do. I'll go with a German beer. Okay. Any brands? Uh, you know, Hofboy you can get here in the states, and so that's something that's pretty dependable. Okay. Okay. A good, a good Munich, Munich based beer. I All enjoy right. it. There you go. What's your What's your favorite app on your phone? Unfortunately, it's probably the email app because of all the things that we've got going on with BMAX group right now. It's, I don't know if that actually counts. Probably my second favorite is my Whoop app, uh, track of, uh, of health and fitness. There you go. Okay, there you go. There you go. So, so, so speaking of health and fitness, do you have any guilty pleasures? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, my nutritionist is probably going to come across this thing. Uh, you know, I I probably don't eat as, as healthy as I ought to. I love myself some good ice cream. I specifically like a coffee-flavored ice cream with uh, with mocha chips in it, and I can eat that thing breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Man, I hear you, buddy. I hear you. Now, you, you mentioned how much you... <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> you mentioned earlier... That you're a big fan of, you, you do like the Top Gun movie, but what is your favorite movie of all time? Is it Top Gun or is it something else? It's a wonderful life. Uh, Frank Capra, um, yeah. I think that movie is just such an epic, epically brilliant film. Ends on such a positive note. Love it, love it, love it, love it. Followed closely by the natural director's cut. Ah, okay, okay. Now, it's a wonderful life for me every year. That's uh, Christmas Eve. That's what I have on. Uh, watch. I, one of the stations always plays that, but I, no matter what, I find it, and we're going we're gonna to watch that every year. So just love the story, no doubt about it. Exactly. So what's uh, let's let's do a couple more. You mentioned you're a big music guy. So what is your favorite band of all time? You two. Okay. Uh, I came up, uh, you know, following them in the '80s. Then I got a chance um, to start to start going to their concerts, uh, and I've been going to their concerts across the world. Uh, I was there at Camp New when they kicked off the U2 360 tour. 92,000 people uh, there in Spain. My brother flies in from San Diego to join me. It was just so neat. And, you know, through the years, we've been through as many concerts as possible. Bush Stadium was a brilliant one, also on the 360 tour. So being in St. Louis at the home of the 11 time world championship Cardinals, uh, watching them play music was epic. Nice. And they're so good live. Nice, nice, awesome. Well, last question in our lightning round, Cujo. Dogs or cats? Dogs. Okay, there was only one right answer, and you got it, man. So that's <laughs> you passed. I'm that. actually, sh I'm actually shocked that there was a cat category. All right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Well, Cujo, this has been an absolute uh, just a blessing to have you here. We always we call it Eco Ask Why. We wrap up with the why, sir. So you know, let's let's just go back a little bit. So why is knowing how to uh, and implementing the process of debris so critical to business success in the future. Yeah, accountability is the core of, a, of teaming done correctly. If you don't practice accountability well, you're not a team. Mm -hmm. And so if, if, if you organize as a team to accomplish your work, which I think most businesses do, then you've got to get accountability right. Right, right. Well, Kujo, this is again. Thank you so much. Where where should people go to connect with you to learn more about Vmax? Do you, you give a shout out a shout out here. We'll make sure we put that in the show notes for our listeners. But where do you want them to go, go to? Yeah, I think if you want to learn more about me, it's robertteschner.com. Uh, last okay. name is T E S C H N E R. Um, but that's also going to lead you to the company Vmax Group. And if you just want to go there, Vmax Group LLC dot com. And there okay. it outlines what we do and how. Absolutely. We'll make sure we sync all that up. And you're pretty active on LinkedIn, too. So we'll put your LinkedIn profile out there for for the listeners to check out. But Kujo, again, thank you so much. It's been just I've learned a ton. I, I knew this was going to be a fun one. So appreciate your time here on Eco Ask Why. Thank you, Chris, for the privilege and the opportunity to be able to speak to your listeners. Brilliant job on the work that you're doing in the world. Thank you, sir. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. 
This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y dot com.